to let people know. Um, on the 17th of November, they have an introduction to GIS, um, so Geographic Information Systems. Um, the workshop will help participants become comfortable with the key concepts of GIS and create basic maps of data. And that's going to be, it's an hour long, so it's just an introduction. That's on November 17th. And then they have um, another Python camp coming up in December. And those run um, every day the week of December 14th, so through the 17th, um, in the afternoons from 1 to 4.30. So it's, uh, and registration will be open on November 23rd at 10 a.m. So what I'll do is I'll post the link to that in the discussion forum for anyone who wants to read about it. Um, those tend to sell out or they're free, so they don't really sell out. They tend to fill up within a couple of hours. So putting it on your calendar of when it opens, if you're going to be able to do it is important. Uh, between now maybe and then, maybe I'll ask even next week for Laura or Megan, who will probably be one of the instructors to come and um, talk about it so that people know more. I saw um, they, that and I, I think I had it on my calendar, but I didn't have the registration date on my calendar. I definitely want to go. In fact, I wanted to put out there, you're saying Garrett is a student and he's now, this is, I guess, second Python based um, presentation. Garrett, what uh, what's your favorite, either a YouTube or online instruction for making um, the beginning steps of learning to code in Python very so clear. I'll tell you what I actually did so I have no coding background uh, like no formal coding background so I've never taken a class on how to program specifically for any particular language and the way I picked it up is uh, there's a website called Code Academy and I actually learned Python 2 not Python 3 but you can go to Code Academy and they have a Python 2 course that's free. I just, I recommend people just go through that because it teaches you all the basics of Python. Now, there's going to be some differences, um, you know, going from two to three, and they're pretty significant when you're more advanced. But generally speaking, um, there's basically no difference really to the beginner between two and three, except the print function, the way the print function works. That's like, that's like the one thing you're going to see that's a big difference. Um, but I would just do that. I mean, you go through it. I mean, I'd say in a week, if you go through it like every, every day for like an hour or so, you'll have all the basics of Python. And then from there, you can really start to build but after that, you're going to need to find some projects to work on or things that you're interested in um, to maybe automate. There's an abundance of what I'm interested in. I, I'm That's actually good. taking CS6010, which I think it was really supposed to be more towards an, uh, an overview of data structures um, in general, but it ended up being more like a learn to program with Python via Cengage class. Gotcha. So, but there's, there's not um, necessarily feedback for when you attempt to code about how to do it correctly or not do it correctly. Right. Yeah, I'd, I'd highly recommend just going through that course as sort of a supplementary material because what's cool about it is, is the whole course, I mean, there's lots of other courses just like this too online. You don't have to do like that one in particular. I just find it's like available and free. Mm -hmm. But what's nice about that one is you, you basically just code whatever little project that they have you code and then they give you immediate feedback whether or not the output is correct or not well the immediate feedback is key yeah so thank you for sharing that with me yeah so that's that's how i picked up coding and i i literally just took that course and then from there i just uh had little projects here and there and then it kind of just ballooned into where 
Um, I'm actually a contractor now and I, I program uh, for that contract specifically. I do development work. So okay. my point is somebody's paying me to do it. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Garrett's rather humble. He's picks it up easily, but he also has a very strong stats yeah, background. I am. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so, um, and I think that helps that he has a very strong math background. So the coding Were you just a probability adds top of that. Major? Uh, I was in a, I was in the uh, econ PhD program here at George Washington. And then I recruited him over to our PhD program. Pro probability and statistics is a, the only kind of math that I was actually good at as an undergraduate. It's an important That's type good. of math. So You know, I, I, I totally to this day credit the professor 1000% because he hit the hot button. He, he just, he made it, you know, so fun by it, making it all about gambling. It was all about rolling <laughs> time, you know, and I, I was on it. I was focused. <laughs> I don't have any other announcements. Those are the main workshops coming up. Um, and again, I think most everyone here, I think, is also in Slack. So we be, we post the events in Slack as well. Uh, do you have any other announcements, John? And if not, we can turn it over to Garrett. Oh, we got our grant. <laughs> oh, yeah. So small thing. We oh, can talk about thing. that more another time, but yeah. Yeah, we once we get some of the logistics figured out, but yeah. Yeah. John and I so. got to have a little party this week of, yay, we got funded to give money to students to do more projects with coding. Congratulations. Yeah. Who, um, who gave you the grant? Pit UN. Yeah, it's called Public Interim. Public Interest Technology University Consortium, but it's actually funded by the Ford Foundation mostly, and then a couple other foundations kick in funding. Um, and we'll be doing paid internships for people to develop their coding skills while working with faculty um, on projects that are public goods projects. So the projects have to be for the public good. Uh, and we're going to have scholarships for students to take their first coding courses. Um, a couple of students who are not traditional to coding and STEM courses. However, that ends up getting defined. Uh, so yeah, we'll be announcing more as I, the university has to finish doing paperwork and negotiations and contracts have to be signed. And, then we can actually start doing things. Um, so that will be coming out through the spring. What, can you remind me the program name, the, the librarian that often visits on Fridays with us? It was um, the database at the library that's built on Python when we had the-, the Oh, workshop. the social network analysis. Yeah, I loved that. I, I, I want to follow back up on that. I've got four more yeah. classes left, left and then I, I want to reach out to her about that. Yeah, her name's Laura. Um, I've, I'll look back for the link. But we I should go ahead and let Garrett get started. Um, I don't want to eat up all his time. So Garrett, I think you should be able to share screen. I will also in the chat room so Garrett's using DeepNote for this, which is a Google Docs for Python program service. I put the link into um, the chat room and you should be able to use that and you'll get to the same screen that Garrett just brought up. And if you want to code along with to try it out yourself as he's doing it, um, you can, under that folder on the left where it says live code event notebooks, you can open up that folder and there are empty notebooks and you can just grab an empty notebook and type away and hit run on the right and it will do whatever you're doing. Um, so you can follow along with Garrett and try doing it along with him if you would like. Um, so with that, I think we'll turn it over to you, Garrett. 
Awesome. Well, hello, everybody. I'm back again, for better or for worse. Um, today, I'm going to be going over an introduction to natural language processing with Spacey. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is direct everyone over to this link right here. You can click on it, or I'll just show you it right here. Um, so natural language processing is the process of basically just extracting information from text data, right? So if you're trying to figure out like if this one name is referenced in one document and then referenced in another document, that would be an example of um, natural language processing. If you're trying to figure out like if these attributes that are in this document are you know, related to this particular entity that's natural language processing. Let's say you you have a PDF of a book and you just want to find all the characters that are in the book. That's an example of natural language processing. So um, there's tons of examples. We'll go through some in just a moment. But the reason I want to show you this is that there are uh, a bunch of different packages for natural language processing inside of the Python language. Um, I would argue probably the best general use one is spacey and that's what I'm going to go over today but there's also the bigger ones are NLTK and core NLP from there um, so I, the reason I want to show you this is for spacey you can pretty much do um, everything that all, all the big stuff um, when it comes to natural language processing all the typical things you do and we'll go over what those are like tokenization part of speech tagging, entity recognition, that sort of stuff. But the real thing I wanted to point out is this little green check mark here in the core MLP column, and it's called co-reference resolution. Um, that is the one big thing that Spacey is missing. And I just wanted to point this out because if you're ever doing a project where you're interested in co-reference resolution, which is the process of linking either entities within a document or linking documents to each other, you're going to need to use Corona P to do that, um, which I'm not going to go over today, but uh, everything else Spacey can pretty much do. Now I see there's also this like red check mark under entity linking for Corona P. And I don't know if that's, I don't think that's up to date anymore because I'm pretty sure Corona P can also do that. So Corona P is really good. Corona P is like, like more, a more advanced version. But for most of the stuff that you're probably going to be doing, if you're going to be using NLP, you're just going to need uh, Spacey. It'll get you all the basic stuff for sure really easily. So just be aware of that. And also be aware that like the Spacey documentation is really good. So if you're doing anything with NLP and you start using Spacey, just go to their documentation. They pretty much explain everything. So um, I'm going to start by importing all my packages. Now, the one thing I want to talk about here is that you can you import Spacey but when you import Spacey, in order to use Spacey, you need to get um, a model on the back end that Spacey will use um, to uh, model all the text information. So you have to download that using your terminal. I have um, it set up in a uh, initialization file, so it'll just download that for me on the before I even started this. But just make sure to do something like this, where you're just using Spacey download. And then whatever model you're interested in, in this case, I have the medium model um, because I can't fit the large model onto this instance, but the larger sizes of the models are obviously better, but the large model is like really big. It's huge, very, very large. Whereas a small model is like tiny, but it's not nearly as good as the large model. It doesn't even have options for um, vector comparisons and word embeddings. So uh, my point is, is just at this stage, just be aware that you can't just install Spacey. You have to install Spacey and then install the appropriate model to be able to use it. Is that um is that a MD or a MO at the end? Sorry. It is an MD. It's uh in core so E N underscore C O R E underscore W B underscore N D. And if you go to the documentation, they'll you know give you these two. So and all the different options. There's a ton of options. Um, and you can even, you know, get other models or like train your own models and use them if you want to do, you get, get more advanced. But obviously the easiest thing to do is just say, um, to uh, basically type this into your terminal and download that model that's appropriate. So um, before we start with Spacey though, um, I'm just going to quickly scrape a website. 
um, to use as we're processing um, with Spacey. And so I'm gonna do this just using Beautiful Soup. I'm not gonna go over Beautiful Soup today. I don't know if you guys have talked about it before, but it's this really awesome um, parser for HTML context. Um, so what you can do is you can use this to basically just, um, you, can, you can request a URL, raw URL, info, URL from wherever you want right here. And I'm using requests in this case. There's other packages that you can use. But uh, then from there with this raw information here, I just pass that to Beautiful Soup uh, just with the text information and Beautiful Soup will then parse that HTML. So I don't, I, you can tell it's just one line. I just do one line and you get this uh, nice parsed out um, web page that you can start to use. So I'll go ahead and run that and show you this. This is the output. You can tell here, like the normal data is actually this big jumble of stuff that doesn't um, make much sense. But when you parse it out, it this is just the HTML text. Um, so no, you know, nothing like I'm gonna go and just be aware that Beautiful Soup is a great package if you ever need to web scrape anything. And for our purposes today, I'm just gonna be getting the text data and using that. So everything that we're talking about can be used on any type of text data. Um, and that's, that's the most important part. Um, you don't need to, you don't need to be like, this is, doesn't just work for websites is what I'm trying to say. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I have this um, HTML parsed information and then I can use this soup find all and I'm just gonna get the paragraphs. Um, so showing you this here, um, that took the HTML code and anything with this P tag, it's gonna grab that HTML code. So now I have all the paragraphs of this document. So in fact, I'll show you, this is just a totally random um, uh, news article and I'm taking all the paragraph information from this news article. So that's where this information came from. So now um, we can start to use Spacey and you can see here, the first thing I do is I say Spacey load and then I give it the model name. In this case, that's the EN Core Web MD. So if you're gonna use a small model, instead of MD, you're gonna need to have SM. If you're gonna use a large model, you need to have LG. But my point is, is like, this is where you say, okay, I'm gonna load in the model and save it as an object. And then um, I use that object and feed it that text information. And these, this text, what this is, is uh, I took all the paragraphs and I just concatenated them together into one object called text. So this text contains all the information, all the paragraph information um, in this news article here. So that's what that is. And so what's so awesome about this is I put it into the model. It processes the whole, um, the whole article. And then when it's done, I'm basically done. Like that's it. I just did all the stuff and then Spacey will do all the rest for me. Um, in terms of looking at the different different options you have. So here's an example. If I go through and I say for sent in output sense, so I have the output here. This is the output of the NLP model. I then call this sense method on it, and then I'm just gonna print all those out. And you can see here what it's doing is it's printing out all the sentences inside of this article. So we have a prototype for Ford autonomous vehicles. So it's talking about autonomous vehicles, there's this new technology, C-V2X, blah, blah, blah. Um, May I interrupt and ahead. ask you for, for the applicability to make sure that I'm following you? Yeah, so uh, at this point, I would say, uh, let's hold off on that question just for a little bit later, okay. because I just wanted to demonstrate to you at this point that the model is basically working. You can see that I'm just grabbing the sentences separated out but really the use case comes right here. So this is pretty much the answer to your question of here's some things that you can do with Spacey. So you can tokenize the data. And what that does is you're segmenting each piece of text, each word into some sort of token that you can then do further analysis with. Okay, so for example, let's say you want to push this the output of this model into another model where you're gonna say, I want the tokens that have a part of speech tag as um, a noun. So I want all the things in this document. 
Um, now you can do that with um, the spacey output. So for example, if I run this here, what this is doing is it's going through um, the model and I'm taking each token inside of this model and then I'm printing out all of these attributes of the token, okay? So for example, what this has done now is it's broken, it's completely analyzed that whole article that we just went through. And now I have, for with each word I have, whether it's a noun, whether it's, an, uh, it's a verb, um, in terms of the part of speech tag, I have the lemma from the text. So this is really helpful, for example, if you're looking for um, some part of text where you wanna know if somebody like took a particular action, right? And that's um, given in this document that you have. But that action, that verb can have, um, can take on different forms. So a good example is let's say we're looking for a close, right? Well, the problem with close is it could be, I'm going to close the door, that person closed the door. Um, um, you know, you have present past tense. And so the lemma, what it'll do is it'll take off um, all of that uh, extra pieces. So you can see here, you're basically assigning words, their root form or a base form, right? So a good, there's really good here, a good example here where um, you're basically taking, if you're looking at was, the limit of was is to be. The limit of rats with plural is just a rat. And so if you're going to give this information to a computer, you really need to be mapping all of the past tense or the plurals to the same root information because you're really talking about one concept that you're looking for, whether or not it's plural. So you can use lemmas um, to get at that information um, and give it to a, give it to a computer, not have your not have the computer get confused on whatever you're whatever you're particularly interested in. Um, now I'll talk about the dependency parses in a little bit, um, and then you have, for example whether or not these are alpha numeric characters. So whether they're letters or the, whether they're lump numbers, then it'll tell you whether each one of these tokens is a stop word. A stop word is a word that um, contains effectively no information. So for example, like a is, uh, was, those don't really say anything. They're in um, most text. Um, and so they're considered stop words. They're, not really relevant to extracting the information you're interested in. Um, so an example of this um, would be uh, like a project I've recently worked on. Now I use uh, crosstalk document co-references. So I need to use Stanford core NLP along with Spacey. But an example in that situation was I had a whole corpus of um, Reuters news articles. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to take all of these news articles and figure out what news articles were linked to each other. Okay, so if I have a news article, um, in this case, it was a lot of uh, commodities uh, news articles. So if I have a news article about, um, let's say a particular person, uh, or let's say, do, let's say it's mergers and acquisitions. So I have a company that's merging with another company. Now I wanna find all of the news articles that are linked together that all describe this merger to get as much information about this merger as possible. And let's say I'm a trader. Well, that's really useful for me because the more information I have about this merger, I can tell uh, more accurately whether it's gonna go through or whether or not I need to buy this stock or buy that stock. Um, so being able to link all of, like scrape the website for all these news sources and then figure out all, how all these documents are linked together um, using natural language processing could be really useful for traders, for example. Um, so that's like one, one use case I've recently worked on. Um, so you can see here, uh, I, there's not really much code in this. You just run the model and then you can, we can get out these information on these tokens. Um, you can also get out information, for example, from entities. So um, Spacey will not only tokenize all of the, uh, all the parts to your whatever document that you're giving it, but it will also flag certain things as different type, different kinds of entities. So for example, you can see here, 
it's flagging this entity, this token that uh, has text as billions. Uh, it gives you the start position and end position of where the entity is located in the original document. And then it tells you what label, what type of entity that is. In this case, it's a cardinal number. Thousands is cardinal. Um, you can see this person, Kim here, this is a person. Um, Kim's a person again. We have Ford is an organization. 2022 is a date. So really right off the bat, you can get tons of uh, information from whatever document you pass into this uh, pretty quickly and has some great, um, great things you can do with it. So here's an example of looking at a dependency tree. Um, I'm going to take a random sentence uh, right out of this uh, document. But what this sentence does, or what a Stanford core, or sorry, uh, what Spacey can do is it can take that sentence and then strip it down into its, all of its dependencies, um, where each token, how it's related to all the other tokens in the sentence. So this is a great example where not only will it relate the tokens, but it tells you exactly how they're related. So a lot of this stuff kind of, you know, you need a little bit of, uh, decent understanding of how the English language works. Uh, I'm not the best in that regard, but for example, you know, this verb remains is related to which in terms of a noun subject. You know, if you go over here, we have prepositional phrases, um, pre prepositional objects. Uh, so here's an example. So we have this person, Nathan Cox. And so you can see here, this is a compound. So it's saying that these two are together as a proper noun and they're related in this verb. So now you know Nathan Cox was the one who said something. And then that said is related back here somewhere else. But you can also see that not only that, but he's also related to this noun here where he's a spokesman. So now you know Nathan Cox said something that's in the prior part of the sentence. We also know that he's a spokesman for a particular company. And it's probably the company that's stated in here somewhere. But the reason why this dependency parse is so important is because it allows you to give the computer information that you would naturally understand as a human, right? So I read the sentence and I know Nathan Cox said whatever was said and that he's a spokesman for whatever this company is. But the computer doesn't know that. With a dependency parse, you can move down the dependency tree and link all these things together and determine, um, determine thing, match things like Nathan Cox being part, being a spokesman for this particular company. So um, that can be really useful um, when you're trying to figure out um, how things are related within a document, for example. Um, you also have this really nice dependency render or entity, um, entity recognizer. And what the entity recognizer will do is it will look at your tokens and flag them for you and show this to you. So you can see here's the same sentence and the what Spacey will do is it'll automatically find all of the entities that exist within this sentence, flag them for you and present them to you in a nice human readable output. So you can determine whether or not this model is adequate for your purposes. But what Spacey is basically doing here is saying, all right, you gave me a sentence. Well, the organizations of the sentence are Toyota and DSRC. You have a date, 2021 in this sentence, a cardinal number, and then a person. Um, and with that information, you can, like, let's say you want to know, like, what entities exist inside a particular document. Well, now you can use Spacey to find those entities uh, directly without having to do some fancy coding or anything. Um, the model will do it all for you. And so you can also do things like, uh, looking at vector similarity. So what this is, is um, you can represent words as a vector in a vector space. And then you can simply look at the distance between those two vectors. And what that will tell you is the closer the vectors are inside of the vector space, the more similar they are. So in this example, I have a sentence. Frogs and toads are similar. Steel and frogs aren't. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take out uh, the word frogs, I'm going to take out the word toads, and I'm going to take out the word steel. And then I'm going to compare them 
using vector similarity and a pre-built model inside of the, uh, the, the medium uh, spacing model. So basically what this does is when you load it in that medium model, you have a, it comes, the medium model comes with a vector space. The larger model comes with a much larger vector space in terms of dimensionality. So it's much better than the medium. Just be aware of that. But you have this vector space and frogs, toads, and steel are all represented inside of that vector space. And they all have a distance from one another that's contingent upon their use in the English language um, that uh, this vector space model has been built off of. So running this, you can see uh, it's saying that frogs and toads are very related. So a relationship of one means that they're the same thing. A relationship of zero means they're not. So in this case, frogs and it should be steel. I don't know why I have a pasta there, but let me change this. You can see frogs and steel are uh, not similar at all. Um, and this is telling us that frogs, toads, and steel are all within the model. So that's really important because um, it's better if your words are with actually within the vector space that you're looking at um, so that they can be better compared. It means that they, the, the vector space uh, has those actually exists, the words actually exist within those vector spaces to be compared. If they don't, then you have to approximate them. Um, so long story short, what this allows you to do is you can take two words and compare them directly. So let's say uh, I'm going to replace the word steel and I'm going to replace it with something like that's related to frogs. So let's say like ponds. Okay. Ponds and frogs are fairly related. This still says steel just because I have it written in here, but um, you can see that they're a lot, they're way more related than uh, frogs and steel are. So you could say frogs and let's say trees. Uh, frogs and trees are pretty related. Frogs and rocks. Frogs and rocks are less related, but more related than frogs and steel. Um, frogs and fish. Frogs and steel, frogs and fish are pretty related. But now let's choose something that frogs shouldn't be related to, right? So let's say computer. Frogs and computer are not related at all. They're not very related at all. Uh, frogs and cars, maybe they'll be more related because of Frogger or something, but uh, still not very related. Keyboards. Frogs and keyboards, not all that related. Definitely less related than frogs and toads. So you can see this, this is an interesting situation where you can just compare the similarity, generally speaking, of words in the English language. Um, so that's pretty much the highlights of everything I had for you guys today. Um, what questions does anyone have? So, oh, go ahead. Oh, so go back up. So you loaded Spacey. Now scroll down. Okay. Um, I was trying to follow along, but then, so when you did the pulling the paragraphs with the. Yes, that's right here, yeah. Um, now is that finding, is that a built-in function, the P, or is that just looking for the HTML P within the greater than, less than? Um, so this is a, it's kind of both. It's a built, so find all is a built-in function uh, to beautiful soup. And when I give it P, it's saying find all tags that are of this type. In this case, I'm giving it the P for the P tags. So I'm saying, give me all the P tags. Okay, so it has to be a tag though within HTML. So like yeah, you could do H1 headers or... Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I was... So it's not looking for keywords, it's looking for things within tags. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. That's why I was confused. Yep, so gets, this gets me all the paragraphs. And then with those paragraphs, uh, we go and do everything else. So um, as far as use cases go, 
it really, there's so many things you can do with MLP and it's pretty, there's a lot of stuff that's really overlooked. Like people don't use MLP nearly as much as, I mean, it's used a lot, but it's used a lot less than I would imagine it would be used because you can use, so you can scrape, you can scrape websites for information, right? But then how do you get the actual information out of those websites? You would use something like this NLP to do that. You know, um, the things, topics that come to my mind due to uh, some of the work and things that I've done in my past. Um, financial information is a great example where you're trying to get, uh, you're trying to do some sort of trading. It could be in any market. It could be in real estate. And there's all this information on the web just sitting out there. And if you can scrape all that information off, you might be able to have a, might be able to give you a little bit better of an edge of what's going to happen in the future for a trade, um, a trade that's about to take place or a particular commodity or stock. Or maybe there's an area in real estate that's doing really badly and it's being reported in the news, but nobody's really paying attention to it. You can scrape that information and then you can pass it into uh, an NLP model like, um, like we have with Spacey here and then begin to extract, you know, um, you know, if you're looking at, let's say the real estate market, um, how well the real estate market's doing, right? Um, you can figure out what, what corporations are involved with um, all the trading that's going on in a particular area, or you can figure out if a company is actually doing pretty poorly or you can compare, um, you can tie different documents together that other people might not be able to do. Um, so yeah, uh, I recommend if you want to use any of this stuff, just go into the spacey documentation. You have like, they have tons of stuff on this that, and they do a really good job, I think, of explaining it all. Um, some specific examples of what you can do using spacey is tokenization. So you're segmenting the text into words or other, other um, parts of speech. You have parts of speech tagging that specifically determines things to be a noun, a verb, et cetera. Um, the dependency parsing is what we talked about where you're basically parsing out a, uh, the sentence in its entirety and then taking that sentence and being able to give it to the computer so the computer can understand how the words in the sentence are related to one another. Uh, limitization is just, you're just breaking down um, a word into its more canonical form. Um, like we talked about before, the was to be, uh, rats to rat, so plural to singular, past tense to present, present tense. Um, now, things that we didn't talk about that you can do is you can detect the boundary of sentences. We talked about named entity recognition. So you're going to find uh, all sorts of objects um, like we have here, persons, companies, locations, um, dates, currencies, that sort of thing. So like I was saying, like for finance, if you're doing, if you're a trader and you want to see, okay, I want to be able to pull out all the currencies and see how they're they're trading against, let's say the lira or something. Let's say you live in Turkey. If you know anything, if you've been following the news about Turkey, they're in a major currency crisis right now. So um, it'd be helpful to know, you know, if you're a Forex trader to know how, um, how all the currencies are doing against one another. Because if you look at Turkey, um, the Turkish lira to the dollar is something like eight right now. So eight liras to the dollar. Um, just a few, I was there literally like a year ago and it was five to the dollar. So that's crazy because you go to Turkey right now and your wealth is like, it really feels like it's eight times. Um, and when I was there, it felt like it was five times. It was crazy. Um, so that, entity, that brings me to a question that I had, I had two uh, questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, you, you brought up international. So um, is there the ability to use Spacey um, and foreign languages? 
translated to English and also to scrape the dark web? Okay, so dark web stuff, I mean, in theory, it can, I mean, there's no, it will work on anything that you, any type of uh, text information. So if you're able to get dark web information, you can scrape that, no problem. Or sorry, you can process it using spacing, no problem. Um, the only thing about dark web is that uh, that means that the pages aren't indexed. So you can't like go to Google and search them, right? You actually have to know what address to type in to get you there. Um, so yeah, it'll work on anything that you, any, any type of um, text information. Now, as far as foreign languages go, Spacey does have multi, uh, multiple language support. So it'll work for a whole bunch of different types of languages. However, in my experience, um, the other models for other languages are far, are very inferior compared to the English model, mainly due to the fact that most people that are using Spacey are using it um, for English. And so I think the Chinese model is actually pretty decent, but there's like a bunch of issues just with how uh, Chinese language, the Chinese language is written. Um, so like they don't have like clear, like the clear segmentation between sentences like we would have in English, right? So we have like these periods and these nice spaces and stuff. Um, so it makes it really easy for, for Spacey to parse out that language as opposed to Chinese or Japanese. I believe I'm, I don't speak these languages, so um, I don't know for sure, but um, especially when it comes to uh, like, I think Spanish is pretty good too. Um, but it definitely has multi multiple language support. Um, just be aware that the uh, model's accuracy is not equivalent across languages. So some languages are just don't, uh, the model doesn't produce very accurate results for compared to the English models. Um, now, in terms of translation, um, it doesn't have any translation abilities that I'm aware of, but um, probably the thing to do would be to parse the model using a foreign language, you, use a foreign language model inside of Spacey, and then from there, you translate the tokens or whatever you're working on. That might, that might work. I don't know. I haven't really worked with foreign languages. Um, so hopefully those kind of answers your question. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, and then you can do entity linking. So this is really, really helpful because you can take a person that is referenced inside of a document and then determine whether um, another person that's referenced in that document is the same person. So an example of this would be like somebody named John Smith. If you have somebody that's named John Smith, and let's say it's just a really generic name and a lot of people just happen to have it, you might have a question. Is this John Smith the same John Smith that's referenced um, much further on in the document. And this entity linking can help you to determine that um, in an automated fashion by the context that surrounds the particular entity, right? So it's, if it's like John Smith at Ford, and then you have another later on, it's like, oh yeah, John Smith at Ford, um, you're gonna be able to link those entities together um, based on that additional context. Uh, we talked about similarity, you know, with uh, comparing vectors. Um, there's other ways to do it. Um, the easiest one is vector similarity though. Um, and then you have the rule-based matching. That's just using particular rules to determine whether or not two things are the same. Um, those can be really, really powerful for very specific contexts but not powerful for generic context, right? So if you work with the rule-based matching and you focus on a very particular subtopic, it's typically gonna work better than just uh, matching um, based on these more general models, but you can't, but you have to make that work. There's no out of the box model that just, that's just gonna work for. Um, obviously you have text ca classification, we talked about that. Um, like assigning a particular label or category to an entity. Um, and then that's, those are the basic highlights of Spacey. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Remember Spacey can do all sorts of this, all sorts of different stuff. It's really, really powerful. 
The one thing it's really missing though is this co-reference resolution. So if you want to compare things across documents, you're going to need to jump over to Core NLP. But with that, you can pretty much, it gives you all the basic features that you need for um, doing any sort of natural language processing project that you're interested in. So that's pretty much all I have. Uh, have any Thanks, anyone has any questions, feel free to let me know now or at a later time, of course. Yeah, I think this is really useful coming after the one we saw the other week on using Twitter data. Because what you get back from Twitter, maybe not quite natural language, but it would be considered NLP, even though 140 characters isn't natural. <laughs> um, but if you wanted to break down and find within a Twitter data set, and you had 8,000 tweets about subtopic, and you wanted to break down and see like how often did this person talk about this organization? Spacey would be a fine yeah. tool for doing that, it seems. It'd be a fantastic tool for doing that, yeah. And we'll leave the deep note. You can always use that link. It's a, it's a project for coders, so we can just leave that there and I'll keep it there. And if you want to play around with his code, um, just don't do it in the notebook that he wrote. Copy it into your own notebook. Um, you can use those event notebooks that I created, or you can create your own. Um, but try to leave his code alone. He's already put into there so that when you start it, it will load the packages automatically. Um, so yeah, don't mess with that requirements document either. That's what loads packages in there. And we could always fix it, but it's better off if you don't mess with that part of it. Better than that, have at it, have fun. Um, find your own URLs to bring in data from and then parse them in different ways and see what you find. Hey, since we got a few more minutes, um, I want to ask the language question again. Um, I, I, I have not really done much text analysis stuff. so. I don't know uh, uh, the details about how this works, but I've, I've always thought that it might be easier to do this kind of thing in something like Chinese because the words are kind of already tokenized. Like yes. in English, like you have to, like we have all these crazy variations of every word. Like just take, take the, try to describe the sentence involving eating something. Right, you have eat, eaten, ate, like the whole word changes to ate if it happened yesterday. If it's happening now, it's eating, and so you like you gotta like do all this processing. But in Chinese, it's just shi, that's it. It's always eat, and it never changes. So the verb, regardless of the context, is the same. And so if you're trying to get at is this about eating something, then you've got a token. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, one thing that what you're actually talking about is uh, probably that not tokenization. It might be something else. Uh, yeah, well, you can, yeah, it's uh, so there's a concept called stimming, and stimming. What you do with stimming is you match all those similar words like you just described down to a root word. So you have stimming and limitization. Limitization is dealing with like the, you know, from plural to singular, from past tense to present tense, that sort of thing. Stimming is from uh, like across different types of words. So eat, uh, you know, all those examples that you pointed out. That problem is actually a pretty easy problem. Um, and it doesn't require, um, you know, really, as, as far as I understand, really like significant computational processes to determine um, um, how you can find the different stems from a root word. Um, now, I, there are definitely 100% things that are easier in Chinese language, in parsing Chinese language using a model like this, from what I understand, in that what you're saying, like, what you're pointing out is like, they're, all the words are like these like, nice, compact um, concepts that are uh, separated out, as opposed to, you know, for example, uh, English, where you have, you know, so many letters and we're just combining those letters in different ways. Now, the one caveat though is that uh, there are other things about Chinese that make it harder to parse. 
Um, and from my understanding, it's like the way, the way the concepts and the sentences run together. Um, but I'm not like 100% sure on that. So um, I'm probably not the best person to ask. <laughs> I don't speak Chinese, so. I don't know. It's just an interesting like problem where computer science meets with language yeah. and culture. Well, uh, it's, it's funny because like I'm like, I'm not good at English, right? So, uh, so like when you're doing natural language <laughs> processing, you have to like really be aware of like what a noun subject is and like how are these words relate to one another, how a preface, what a prepositional phrase is. And like a lot of these things, like some of them, I don't even know what they are, you know? So it's like, <laughs> you yeah, gotta kind of like I, look it up. I think there's probably some really interesting, probably fundamental differences in how underlying algorithms get structured if you're using yes. Chinese and other languages that it's probably better to just use a whole different approach because there's whole concepts and phrases that just don't even have a translation really like the concept of a a four character idiom a cheng yu this idea is like if you translate that thing literally you'll get some random four words that make no sense like rock stream wind water or something like that and the translation will be literal and not have any sense. But in the Chinese context, it's an idiom that means something. And so translating it makes, you know, total nonsense to English literally. And I don't know how an algorithm would, would pick that up versus and be able to identify that that is an idea, that is a phrase, an idiom versus the constituent parts of that, you know, those four words. Yep. So this is like stuff that um, I think is a bit more I'm, I'm really curious to see how programs like this are built in other languages and in Chinese in particular, just because it is such a uniquely different language from so many alphabet languages, alphabet based languages, you know? Yeah. Um, but anyway, very, very cool stuff. I'm sure there's a great tool out there that I just oh, don't know about. <laughs> and it, it should be, it should be pointed out that uh, when I say um, like Chinese is harder to deal with, I I really mean it's harder to deal with for the coders that are designing these models because they don't, all, like the majority of coders that are coding space, to my understanding, are all English speakers. And so for that exact reason, the English models are, just end up being better. Um, That's what I mean. I, I think there's probably a, a whole different model that is and probably we just don't even know about. And I'm sure, and yeah. I, I was gonna add that um, each one of the language models is completely different. Yeah. Um, yeah. And designed for that particular language um, for the reasons we just discussed. So. Oh, Jai, I think you want to say something. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, I just have a dumb question, if that's okay with everyone. Um, I give I'm... you a dumb answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Um, so I'm a new GMBA student that's looking into uh, making it a dual degree in mastering information systems. So I've touched on Python before, but I've never like uh, looked at anything that's related to nat natural language uh, processing in any way. So, but I've <laughs> scraped web data and PDF data before. Um, so I guess I have a like question about the way of thinking. So when I was like tasked to do, to scrape data, I was like, um, for example, in econ, I want to scrape out the PD, uh, the GDP numbers across multiple documents. And then I put them in an Excel and then I compare the numbers. But like, what's the idea of using similarity or um, What's the other one? Dependency tree analysis to um, to understand about all the information about a project, for example. Like, what's the uh, thinking process behind that, or how can you give me an example of how you use the dependency tree, or how you use the similarity to solve problems? Like, yeah, uh, so. I would say <laughs> similarity is useful. So both of these things can be used in an example where let's say we have a one sentence, just for simplicity. We have a single sentence 
And the sentence references a person, a particular person that exists in a particular company, right? And let's say they have a salary of this much, right? 